today, Black Shit. I'm not having purified drink of water. They got it is up there. Shouts out to the toilet drive support the people, not the cause, man. Now, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for my um, my visual absence, and I want to um, call this more of my from the stadium play. Okay, as you see, I'm not present, but we still get into information. So these next few videos are gonna be like this. From a stadium stands perspective, meaning I will be taking a visual absence for the next 10 videos, maybe 12 videos, could be more, but um, I'll see you guys soon, and uh, as always, support the people, not the cause, man, and um, anyway, um, yeah, you're going to hear the same audio for each one of those videos too, so if you click the last video, you heard this, and if you click the next video, you're going to hear the same thing, but that's how we do it from a stadium stands. but yeah, just to keep it up to date. We're going to be talking about Enoch and all kind of stuff. From Enoch to uh, Jacob to, to to the TNK. Another thing on top of another thing. What I mean by stadium stance is, you know, I have my left fields and I have my right fields. Um, I said there's going to be no center fields or shortstops yet, but this was more like stadium stance because, for one, I'm taking a visual absence. You know, I'm like out there in the crowd on this one. <laughs> and for two, it's kind of like me sitting back. You know, I'm not pushing, pushing this, trying to convert or like I said, or do anything other than provide information. So that's what I mean by stadium stands. I'm going to take a back seat on this one and watch the game. Okay. If that makes any sense to you. Wish y'all could see me do this when I do this. Cue that music I like. A Robin Peter to pay In a previous video, I said the Book of Enoch is like an ancient spin-off, a work of literature that ultimately derives inspiration from previously established characters and stories, but expands on that source material in a new way. In the case of Enoch, the main character is a fairly obscure biblical character who is mentioned only briefly in the Book of Genesis. Enoch is the father of the oldest man to appear in the Bible, Methuselah, but then Enoch mysteriously just goes away. The apocalyptic text First Enoch, written hundreds of years after Genesis, inserts the character Enoch into another brief but tantalizing story in Genesis 6, about divine beings called the sons of God, who are said to come down to earth, impregnate human women, and birth a race of beings called Nephilim. Enoch expands these few verses into a huge drama about fallen angels called the Watchers, coming down to earth and corrupting humanity. But the Book of Enoch is not the only episode in the Enoch saga. There's also the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, or as it's more commonly called, the Second Book of Enoch. And while the name might make you think it's a sequel, it's more like a remake or a retelling. Like the flood of live-action Disney remakes, Second Enoch retells the essential elements of First Enoch, while giving its own unique flourishes. And like any remake, to further their message and outreach, Second Enoch probably aimed to capitalize off the awareness and legends generated by its famous predecessor, First Enoch. While both describe Enoch's ascent to heaven and witnessing divine secrets, they're very different texts. First Enoch is basically five independent books stitched into one. Second Enoch is a more cohesive text, consisting of several sections. Enoch's journey into the heavenly realm and encounter with God, Enoch's conversations with his sons, telling them what he saw, and a third part that introduces some backstory to the mysterious priest king Melchizedek. Second Enoch has fascinated people for centuries. It apparently was known to the dualist Gnostic group called the Bogomils in Bulgaria. Centuries later in the 20th century, the American American Unitarian pastor, Charles Francis Potter, even tried to argue that Jesus wrote Second Enoch, and he advocated for it to be added to the New Testament. But Second Enoch remains obscure, and definitely overshadowed by its more famous source text, First Enoch. But no longer. Today, we're examining Second Enoch. First, a basic overview of the text. It's generally divided into 73 chapters, originally written in Greek, and possibly dates to the first century CE. Now, you might have noticed these asterisks there on screen, and it's because each one of these statements is problematic. Even the chapter numbers are not set in stone, because there are in fact two versions of Second Enoch floating around, a longer version and a shorter version. And these different manuscript traditions lead us to the next two questions. What was its original language, and when was it written? 
when reconstructing an ancient text from manuscripts, scholars like to see a lot of manuscripts so you can compare them and try to identify the original text. Try to identify any changes that might have been added to or subtracted from the original. This is a problem when it comes to Second Enoch because the manuscripts are a mess. Unlike First Enoch, which survives in Aramaic among the Dead Sea Scrolls, in other words, very ancient and very useful manuscripts for reconstructing First Enoch, the earliest Second Enoch fragments are super late. The full text only survives in medieval manuscripts written in a Slavic liturgical language called Church Slavonic, or sometimes simply Slavonic. The earliest of these date to the 14th century, but the other manuscripts are from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. So, super late. And this is why Second Enoch is sometimes called Slavonic Enoch. However, this all changed in March 2009, when the scholar Joost Hagen stumbled upon four overlooked and unpublished fragments of Coptic that were discovered at the Cathedral Fortress of Qasr Ibrim. Located in ancient Nubia near the southern border of Egypt, this archaeological site is so remote and so dry that archaeologists even found a dried Roman sandal preserved there. Dry enough to preserve some pretty ancient texts, and although he didn't know it at first, Hagen soon realized that he was looking at a Coptic version of Second Enoch, dating to around the 8th century. The earliest material and literary evidence for a text that, up until then, was only known from late medieval manuscripts. So why don't we call Second Enoch an 8th century text based on this evidence? Well, there's a lot of reasons to believe that it's much more ancient. Ancient. Even though these fragments date to the medieval periods, many Coptic and Slavonic texts are translations from earlier Greek manuscripts, and scholars think this is the case with Second Enoch. Not only does it follow the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, called the Septuagint, whenever it alludes to the Bible and biblical names, but it also makes a play on words, or an acrostic of the name Adam, that only makes sense in Greek. And there are even linguistic hints that there is an even more ancient Aramaic or Hebrew core to the text. So scholars assume that the text was originally written in Greek, maybe parts of it in Hebrew or Aramaic, but regardless, much earlier than its Coptic and Slavonic manuscripts. How much earlier? Well, we just don't know. Because it shows a close connection to some ideas from Hellenistic Egypt, most assume the text originates from Jewish writers in Alexandria in the early centuries CE. Some even argue for as early as the first century, before the destruction of the Second Temple, while others say it was written sometime in the second or third centuries. Ultimately, that's probably the best we can do when it comes to pinpointing its exact date. Okay, let's talk about the content. What's in Second Enoch? Second Enoch comprises three major sections. Enoch's heavenly journey, Enoch's report to his sons of what he saw in a second heavenly journey, and finally, an odd few chapters at the end discussing the miraculous birth of the mysterious figure Melchizedek. The first two sections follow standard conventions of apocalyptic literature. Now, apocalyptic today generally means end of the world disasters, and apocalyptic literature in antiquity certainly focused on the end times. But the word really just derives from the Greek word meaning a revealing or a revelation. And so, apocalyptic literature generally focuses on the divine world being revealed to a human mystic. By ascending through multiple heavens, a human is shown angelic beings or future rewards and punishments for the righteous and the wicked. As in other apocalyptic tours of heaven, such as the Ascension of Isaiah, Enoch is guided by angels who serve as trip setters or tour guides for his mystical experience. In chapter 3 of Second Enoch, Enoch describes how these angels took me up onto their wings and carried me up to the first heaven and placed me on the clouds. And there I perceived the air higher up, and higher still I saw the ether. So already at the beginning of the text, Second Enoch is setting the scene for an increasingly fantastic vision of a multi-layered heaven, as well as central features of apocalyptic literature like hell and Satan. So for example, later after seeing a paradise for the righteous, in chapter 10 there's a striking discussion of a hell-like place. They showed me there a very frightful place, and all kinds of torture and torment are in that place, cruel darkness and lightless gloom, and there is no light there and a black fire blazes up perpetually with a river of fire that comes out over the whole place. And there are merciless angels, carrying instruments of atrocities, torturing without pity. This is probably one of the most vivid descriptions of a hell-like place out of any ancient literature I've read, and it echoes other apocalyptic texts like in First Enoch. 
Then there's the seventh heaven, and if you know anything about the number seven, it's pretty special in biblical literature, and there's no exception here in Second Enoch. Because it's here, Enoch enters God's throne room and witnesses cherubim and seraphim standing all around his throne, six-winged and many-eyed, and they cover his entire throne, singing with gentle voice in front of the face of the Lord, Holy, 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 Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of his glory. This invocation, holy, 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 is called the Kedusha in Hebrew or the Trisagion in Greek, which originally appears in Isaiah 6.3. Almost all later apocalypses refer to it as the angelic song sung or shouted in the throne room of God, and it later appears in both Jewish and Christian liturgies to this day. Finally, this section climaxes in the ultimate example of an apocalypse, in the most literal sense of a revealing. Enoch sees God. Chapter 22 describes this terrifying account, saying that God's face is strange and indescribable, but compares it to iron made burning hot in a fire, and it emits sparks and is incandescent. Ultimately though, Enoch doesn't go that much into detail. The face of the Lord is not to be talked about. It is so very marvelous and supremely awesome and supremely frightening. Enoch then is anointed and transformed into one of the glorious ones. While this sounds like Enoch became an angel or an angelic being of some sort, some scholars argue that this may be merely metaphoric, since in the Dead Sea Scrolls, after death, the souls of the righteous are also compared to angels. After this angelic revelation, God seats Enoch to the left of him and instructs him about the mysteries of creation. The second main part of the text describes Enoch admonishing his sons, telling them what he saw. This section contains probably the most controversial chapter to an ancient audience, because Enoch tries to describe the physical body of God, though only in indirect ways. He says that he saw the lips of God, the face of God, and the right hand of God, suggesting that God has a humanoid corporeal form. This section thus might be a precursor to a form of speculative and controversial Jewish literature dating to around the 5th to 7th centuries, when mystical authors tried to describe the bodily appearance of God. Second Enoch also contains two other components common in apocalyptic literature, a Satan-like figure and fallen angels. In the fifth heaven described in chapter 18, Enoch witnesses an army of miserable-looking angelic beings called Gregori or Watchers. When Enoch asks about them, the angelic tour guide says, These are the Gregori who turned aside from the Lord, together with their prince, Satanael. This is referencing the same story first mentioned in Genesis 6, but expanded in 1st Enoch about fallen angels who come to earth, procreate with human women, and corrupt humanity with evil. But 2nd Enoch is somewhat different than 1st Enoch. While the leaders of the Watchers in 1st Enoch are named Shemihaza and Asael, here in 2nd Enoch their prince is called Satanael, an obvious etymological parallel to the name Satan. 2nd Enoch offers some backstory for Satanael too. In 2nd Enoch 29, on the second day of creation, God creates angels. But Satanael is a deviant archangel who thought to establish a throne in the clouds and make himself equal to God's power. When 2nd Enoch retells the Garden of Eden story, the text equates the crafty serpent of Genesis 3 with Satanael. And in chapter 31, Second Enoch claims that Satanael fled from heaven, became conscious of righteousness and sin, and sought to challenge Adam's rule of the earth by corrupting Eve. And finally, we've reached the most tantalizing part of Second Enoch. Chapters 69 to 73 deals briefly with the life of Enoch's successors, and ends just prior to the Great Flood with the story of the miraculous birth and ascension of Melchizedek. But who is this mysterious figure? Melchizedek's name literally means, my king is righteousness. He briefly appears in Genesis chapter 14, which describes the patriarch Abraham encountering him. Melchizedek is identified as the king of Salem, which is traditionally identified with Jerusalem, and he's described as a priest of God the Most High. He blesses Abraham by this same God with a blessing that becomes the foundation of the first prayer in the Amidah in Jewish liturgy. In 2nd Enoch, Melchizedek gets a major upgrade in a bunch of backstory. According to this story, he was supernaturally conceived without his father's help. When his father confronts his wife about the pregnancy, she falls down and immediately dies. But then Melchizedek emerged from his mother's body, clothed and fully developed as a three-year-old child. Forty days after Melchizedek's birth, the archangel Gabriel takes takes him away, and 2nd Enoch ends with God instructing Noah to build the ark, and God promising to honor Melchizedek as a great king and priest of Salem. This elevation of Melchizedek has raised questions about whether we can consider 2nd Enoch a Jewish or Christian text. In 2nd Temple Judaism, Melchizedek is no ordinary human. In one Dead Sea Scroll fragment,
Testament, Melchizedek is given an angel-like role. In this text, Melchizedek assumes the role of the archangel Michael as the leader of the angels against Belial, another ancient name for a Satan-like figure, and the leader of rebellious angels. Interestingly, in a commentary on Isaiah 52.7, the text says that Melchizedek is your Elohim, suggesting that some Jews living during the Second Temple period viewed Melchizedek as having a divine role. But Melchizedek also plays a huge role in early Christianity. See, in Genesis 14, verse 18, the text says Melchizedek brought out bread and wine, which later Christians interpreted as a prototype of the central Christian ritual, the Eucharist, which would make Melchizedek something like a John the Baptist figure, who paves the way for Jesus. In the New Testament's epistle to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ is identified as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 4, in which King David is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Since, according to Christian tradition laid out in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is not descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses, but rather from King David, the author of Hebrews suggests that Jesus can be a priest and a king. Melchizedek's miraculous conception in 2nd Enoch seems to parallel Jesus' miraculous birth, and one manuscript variant of 2nd Enoch describes Melchizedek as the word and power of God, who will come to earth to enact miracles, which some scholars suggest might be evidence that the text either emerged from a Christian community or at least was tampered with by Christians in later centuries. At least a few passages probably were inserted by later Christian scribes. But whether or not the core of the text is Jewish, ultimately we just don't know. Most people speculating about Melchizedek between the 2nd and 5th centuries were Christians, especially Sethian Gnostics. But importantly, 2nd Enoch never mentions Jesus. And if 2nd Enoch was written in the 1st century, it seems more likely to have been written by Jews, continuing the tradition that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls of elevating Melchizedek to a greater-than-human being. So in these three sections, we see that 2nd Enoch is not a mere copy of 1st Enoch, but rather a retelling that ultimately expands the Enoch literary universe universe, adding mystical speculations about the mysteries of creation, as well as establishing the priesthood of Melchizedek. Ultimately, it's a confounding text, but one that continues the growth of apocalyptic literature, a focus on mystical journeys, angels, Satan, hell, and paradise. Stay tuned for a sequel on Third Enoch,